You guys may be seated. That song was a Mason Grady original that he just wrote. Just wrote that song. Isaac, is your family here? Not yet. We'll, we'll pray for him later. Isaac's family finally made it from Washington, so he is whole. One piece, right? That's awesome. Welcome to One Two Church. I'm Pastor Matt. Uh, I want to thank you for being here. If you're new here, I just want you to know that we are a, uh, a community that's endeavoring to follow the person of Jesus, and that's it, right? So the, the reason behind One Two is one love God, two love people. Uh, but whatever you believe, I want you to know that if you don't even believe that, you still belong here. So wherever you are on the spiritual spectrum, I want, I want you to feel comfortable here. Know that we love you. But we're in the middle of a sermon series that I could literally preach for the rest of my, my career of looking at the words of Jesus and saying, let's just do that. I mean, if he changed the world and he perfected it, I don't want us to have to add or take away from a, a, a perfect message. So we're going to look at the words of Jesus, things that he's he said that himself. And we're going to say, let's just try to do that. OK, because it, it's hard to say, let's just do that and make it sound super, super simple and easy. But I told you that there's going to be some tough weeks. There are going to be some tough weeks. Uh, I know in the past I've said that I was going to give a sermon series titled What I Wish More Pastors Would Say. And what I've decided is just to merge those two together because what I wish more churches would say, what I wish more pastors would say, is let's just look at the words of Jesus and, and try to do that. I, I, I'm, today I'm speaking directly to Christians, pastors, preachers, churches, um, in an effort to fight against anything that hurts the people that I love. Now, I want you to know that I am not not anti-church, not anti-pastor. Um, but what I am is against the perversion of this perfect message. I'm against messages or words being said that hurt the people that I love with the words that, that were never intended to hurt people with, but, but to build people up. Build people up. <laughs> One thing, uh, if you haven't met me, one thing is I believe Jesus is the Savior. I believe He is God. He's changed my life. He's changed my whole perspective on people, how to look at people. I'm in love with Jesus. I'm in love with people because that is God's creation. It's a perfect mirror for this. And I just want to do what He asked. But today I'm going to push back a little bit when it comes to this, uh, the, the twisted message sometimes that comes out of microphones or, or people's mouths the, or doing the same things that killed Jesus in the first place. Uh, we need, and I hope you agree with me, we need more faith, hope, and love in this world. And it only, it only comes through Jesus. But I, I urge you, here's another uh, PS, a little side note. Welcome, Sarah. Hey, we're going to pray for you later. Family's here. Long trip from Washington State that they made um, this week, but I also want to urge you. I, I I I want you to do what I had to do when I first came to a church for the very first time. This this pure message of Jesus, but I want to urge you to do your research. I want I want you to look at the Bible and make sure you don't just take my word for it, but to look at it and and I want. I want you to challenge me as I challenge you of being like, is this really what Jesus said? And I want to look at what Jesus said and say, let's just do that because I'm a simple man, church. If you know me personally, my wife can attest, I'm simple. Like, keep it simple, stupid. That, that is my, my motto in life because, man, this guy that I'm in love with, this God that I'm in love with changed everything. And last week I said that we were going to split the Good Samaritan into two parts and that we were going to do the second part today. But I want to share my heart first. So I'm going to put that on hold till next week because the, the topic that we're venturing into, I need you to know where I stand before I talk to you about the second part of this Good Samaritan. 
But I want to prepare you accordingly. I, I would like to talk about a subject today that when asked, people are undoubtedly the most uncomfortable talking about in church, no question at all. And this is something I wish more preachers and churches would say and something I struggle with. I wish more preachers would say, I think about money a lot. Now, you're thinking, oh, great. I just came to church and they're talking about money again. I want you to know this is the first time that I've addressed the church about money because I, I will be honest with you. And I had a great talk with my brother and he was like, you know what? Jesus talked about it. We need to embrace this idea. But in my head, it has been so perverted in churches, this idea of money, of Hey, you have to give. I, 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 I've been to a church where they would literally look at, at your end of the year tax statement and make sure you gave 10% to the church. I've been to churches where every single week they would push tithing, push money, push offering, push giving. And it put me in a, a spot of bitterness. And I'm going to be upfront and honest with you is that that was never the intention of Jesus. But I'd like to weave into today's talk my own personal journey with money. And whether you like it or not, we all have our own journey with money. You know, I've, I've had a, a bad attitude about money and church. Those two words together. I, I've, I've seen a lot of church hurt, uh, 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 people pushing it, uh, the past experiences that I've had. But then I ask myself, what did Jesus say about the topic of money? Now, you don't have to hide your purse or your wall. We don't want anything from you, okay? We're the one, two church is not here to say you need to, you need to, and you have to give. That's between you and God. If God compels you to give, that's on you. You don't need to come to me and say, hey, hey pastor, I, I tied today. I don't, I don't want this. But what I love about my Savior is he didn't avoid taboo subjects. He went right at it. Subjects that are significant part of our life. And today I want to talk about how I wish, wish more churches and preachers were more honest about this subject and did it the way that Jesus did it. Now, it might be the last time that you join us, so I want to, I want to thank you for, for being here today. We had a good run, church. But I'm going to be very honest today. We're, this is the words of, of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I'm going to the, to the ESV first, so I want you to read it in context. And then I'm going to the message version, which is like an amplified pullback version of, of what this verse says. So we're going to read the same thing, but in two different versions. But it, it literally means the same thing. In the ESV, and for those watching online, this is Matthew 6, 19, 19 through 24. I was asked last week to uh, announce the verses because I realized we have such a high number of people who watch online that I don't always give the verses out because I just assume they can see that, but they can't. Matthew 6, 19 through 24 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. These are the red letters. So for those of you new to church, if you have a Bible and you're like, why is it a different color? Red letters are the words of Jesus that he, he physically literally said. And this is it. Do not lay up your, for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, listen to this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if you're if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. And, and I read this, I'm like, Jesus, are you still talking about money? <clears throat> yes. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Then if then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters. For he, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, we've also perverted uh, a scripture and we, we say, what? Hey, money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say that. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. So I want you to know today, this is not an anti-money talk. 
For the love of money is the root of all evil. But let's look at it in the message version. I love how, how in depth this is. Don't hoard treasure down here where it, where it gets eaten by moths and corroded by rust or worse, stolen by burglars. I was talking to my wife yesterday. I said, do you know what is a really funny word to me? I don't know why it's burglar. Burglar is like, when, my mind instantly goes back to how many of you remember the hamburger from the guys? Yeah. That's where, it, that's where it goes. So whenever I see burglar, we don't use that word enough and we need to start using it more. A burglar. Stockpile treasure in heaven where it's safe for moth and rust and burglars. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and end up being. Your eyes are windows into your body. This this is so telling to me. If you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills with light. If you live squinty eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a musty cellar. If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you will have. You can't worship two gods at once. Loving one God, you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one field feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money both. But this is interesting how Jesus ends. Let's keep this up here. Jesus ends this talk about money with the words worship. So he goes into worship, money and worship. And today, as I share my heart, I just wish we could be more honest. And when I say we, I'm talking about we could be more honest when it comes to church and money. Let's pray. Father, we know this is a, uh, a tough subject. Lord, there, there's a lot of stigmas attached to money and church. And I pray, Lord, that we can sift through that and look at just the words that you have said, how you said it. And Lord, let us, uh, let us learn from you. And Lord, I, I pray, especially for myself, that any preconceived biases that I may have, that you remove them, Lord, and I can just look at your words and, and we can filter through that. And Lord, I also pray that if there's anything that you want me to say or don't want me to say, Lord, that you just take control. That uh, I'll stand in the background and let your words flow through me. In your name we pray. Amen. So this word tithing. We're not getting into tithing today. I want to talk about money, strictly money and church, uh, money and your personal life, money and your professional life. There will be a, a time in the series where I'm actually actually going to teach you about tithing, about why why Jesus talks about tithing. But it's going to be in a different kind of way. Um, but a lot of you know my journey. I, uh, I grew up in a home, I grew up in a, in a uh, different kind of faith, a, a faith where my dad was always the, in the leadership. He was always bishop or president of, of something. So he was always up there, he was always a leader. And he never got paid for it. This was all a volunteer position, a called position, where the church would say, hey, we need you to step into this position. Never a paycheck attached to it. He was just sharing the message that, that he was passionate about and he was called to share and he was leading where he was called. Then I left that faith. I met my wife. We had a beautiful little girl and I really took time. I took two years of really struggling about what type of faith do I follow? Where do I go? I went through every single religious book that you can and I was studying it and I was praying and I was like, I don't even know who I'm praying to, but I need to know the answer to this. Then I gave my life to the Lord because of one verse, John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, uh, the word was with God and the word was God. And then later on it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, which is saying that Jesus is God. And I wasn't taught that before. So I, all of a sudden I was like, this is what I want. I want a relationship with this man, with this God. I don't just want to uh, be a rule follower and, and try to get my life in order by myself. I want a relationship with him. So I gave my life to, the, to Christ. And then my, my world fell apart. A lot of you know the story when it was hurt at work, became addicted to painkillers and alcohol. I went to rehab for that. 
And as I was in rehab, my wife said, there's this church that we need to go and we need to sit in and you need to be with Jesus. You need that. You need this back. And my, my first thought was, no, 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 no. And finally, she got me there and I met with the pastor and I, I left the rehab program, graduated from it. And three months later, well, actually one week after I got out, my wife made this comment. You're going to be a pastor someday. With divorce papers still on the table, she said, you're going to be a pastor someday. I don't know about our marriage, but you're going to be a pastor someday. And I said, I just got out of a program that maybe you need to go to if you think I'll ever be a pastor. Because I'm never, I'm never going to be a pastor. You're on something. <laughs> Turns out three months later, my, my pastor sat me down. He said, hey, we need, a, we need a junior high youth director. And I sat with him, and I remember sitting in it in his living room and I said, you know my, the story of my life. How can I be good enough to, to be in ministry? And he said, let me tell you about this thing called grace and forgiveness and completion. And he said, and, and also who better to teach than those who have walked through it. And I remember stepping into this calling and I was on fire for Jesus. I just loved sharing the message of Jesus. I, I was watching my, pa my pastor and he quickly became my hero. Where I was like, I just wanted, I, I want to do that. I would see how he would tell, talk about Jesus and it would matter to people. And so he said, what that entails is Sunday morning, you're going to teach messages to the youth while I preach and I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, you want me to get this book and you want me to teach out of it? He said, the, the spirit will guide you. So I was, I gave my first sermon in front of the kids and, and we had three or four and it grew to like 150 kids. And, and I, I was so excited. I was on fire for Jesus and I'll never forget a month into it. My pastor invited us to, to dinner. And we went to a sushi restaurant and I'm sitting there and we're just, we're talking about, I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. I get to share Jesus to people. And he said, oh, it reminds me, I forgot to give you this. And he hands me an envelope. And I said, what, what is this? And I open it up and it, it's a check for $500. And I was like, wait, what is this for? He said, you're, you're on staff. I thought you knew this. I thought you knew that this calling, this, this placement of being in the church came with an economic side. And I was like, <laughs> I remember sitting in the rest, that restaurant in California, 29 year old kid thinking, wait, they will pay you for this? Like you get, you get paid. I, I had no idea that you could go tell, tell people about Jesus and they would give you money for it. I was like, this is not a bad deal. This, this is, this is kind of neat how this is going. I remember going home and, and I was saying, wait, pastors get paid. They, they, like you have to get this through my head. Pastors get paid for standing on stage and then meeting with people. And I remember just blown away and I remember praying with my pastor because I, I think he knew he was playing with fire when he saw my, the look in my eye of, of that check handed to me. And he said, Matt, something that I hold true. So if you, if you want to know the, the foundation, the core, when it comes to money with me as a pastor, he said, we will always do this to serve money. I'm sorry, whoa, that is, that, that was a rewind, delete. My pastor did not say that. He said, we will always do this to serve people. I was unfortunate to see, to see people meet Jesus. Like we will, we're, we are not doing this for money, but I didn't know at the time that economics were involved. But I'm going to be honest with you. It's been a while since I've I've been 29 and I've had the opportunity. And, and I know I'm sharing some of my story, but my hope is that it parallels to you, because that's the only that's the only way we'll gain success and traction in this in this sermon today.
But I've been a preacher now for, for 12 years. And, and since then, a lot of people have handed me an envelope and said, thank you for preaching. Thank you for speaking. I've been, I've been around the country, different places, schools, prisons, jail cells, churches, and people handed me that envelope saying, thank you for preaching. And it's been an interesting journey. I wish I could stand here today and say that that money doesn't matter to me, that I'm doing this just, just for God and people. But that's not always true. And I just wish more churches and wish more pastors would be honest about that and talk about this. Because money is a, a revealer. Money, when it's on the table, it, it's cool, right? When it's not on the table, you don't even think about it. But then it's revealed and it's on the table and you say, wait a second, hold on a second. And that, that 29 year old kid eating sushi with his hero, I was, I was giddy having sushi with my pastor saying that was so fun telling people about Jesus. I had no idea, I had no thought of money until it was in an envelope in front of me. But I've had a lot of opportunities since then to check myself. Why am I doing this? What is this message about? But I'm going to tell you the truth. I go back to California in that restaurant with my 29 year old self a lot. Because that guy, all he wanted to do, all, he wanted to be like Jesus, but he'd be all, he also wanted to be like his pastor. And I thought it was so cool when Pastor Tim would, would tell people about Jesus and it would matter to them and it would mean something, something to them. And the, the countenance would change in their, in their faces and in their body. And he was sharing from the greatest book ever written. That would, and the things he was sharing was really helping and aiding and relieving their fear, relieving their anxiety. And I was watching him saying, this is honestly the greatest thing ever. And it wasn't until I was 29 years old that I realized that there's money involved with this. And I, I don't think it's a bad thing, church. I think it can become a bad thing and has become a bad thing with certain, certain situations. Money, money is neither good nor bad. Let's say that before we continue, okay? It's what you do with it. You will never find in the teachings of Jesus, Jesus teaching against money. You'll never find that. Money is a significant aspect of the human journey and our existence. That's why Jesus talked about it. But Jesus also has a perspective and a plan on this. And I, I think Jesus can help each of us. And I, I don't mean to project my problems, my, my struggles, my, my journey with you, but, but do you think about money a lot? Just by the sheer numbers here in the bar, I wonder how many of us currently right now are worked up emotionally because of money. And we've said it before, but Biggie was right. Where you say, if I had more money, I'd be fine. No, more money, more problems. <laughs> the range is varied. It could be because right now you have a lot of it and you're wondering where to invest or what to do with it or who to trust that comes into your life because are they only here because of now I, I have this amount of money that I'm coming into or you could be here right now and you have no idea how you're get, you're supposed to pay rent in two weeks so the range is varied most most of us I would venture to say most of us think about money quite a bit for me not only do I think uh, I'll think about money and it's funny because yesterday I asked Crystal I said do I think about money a lot? And you know what my wife said, that she keeps me in check. She goes, Matt, how am I supposed to know what you think? <laughs> fair, fair. I said, do I talk about money a lot? She was, we said, no. Like I, I, I talk, the least amount of conversation that I'll have usually is about money. But I think about this a lot and I try to check myself because not only do I think about money, income, providing for, for our family, having a daughter who's, who's 21 in California, and how many know that the, the, the 
the money doesn't stop once kids turn 18, right? And, and just all of a sudden, there it goes again. But I have providing for my family. But I also think about money pastorally a lot. Taking care of people in our community. Making sure the water is kept on for certain families. Paying the light bill. We can't, we can't afford rent this month. We're going to be evicted. Let us take care of that. Thinking about how can we do missions? How can we, how can we do an outreach? We now have a church that is global. So how do we stay connected with all of those people? How do we be uh, good stewards of our money here in this church? And I want, to, I want you guys to know, and, and the, the board, the leadership team, I let them know, this church is not a bank. So as the money comes in, we're not hoarding it. We're, it it's going back into the community. The church is outside of these walls. I, I just need to be clear about that. But we have a board and we have a budget. And we have teams that, that keep us accountable, who watch the finances and where did this go? And, and here's how much we spent last year compared to how much we brought in. But I try to check myself every time I come on stage. Why? Because I, I never want to do what Jesus never did. And that was manipulate people or do a hard sell or force anyone to give anything. No, Jesus was so compelling that at his time, not only did they want to give money towards his mission, but they were willing to give their life for him. He didn't have to say, here's the requirement for you to give. He's saying, no, I, his message was so compelling that people gave everything. But it's hard sometimes of walking on stage when not only thinking personally, where I have to think about budget and finances and and rent and car and all of these things. But as a, a as a professional, as a pastor of a growing community. And I just wish more preachers would admit that if they aren't thinking about money when they're coming on stage, it's because they've worked real hard to not think about money. It's a big part of what happens here, church. It always has. But here's the problem. It was supposed to be organic. The, the very first church, people started just willingly, no obligation, giving money so that they could continue reaching, continue stretching, caring, loving people and taking care of them. It's always been a part, but you need to know today. I want you to know today is not anti-money. No, God, economics, whether directly or indirectly, he's all wrapped up in this economic system that we have in this world right now. He's not against it, but he speaks on the subject. And let's go to verse 19. This is interesting to me. It says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moss nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. He's talking about stockpiling. Do not lay up. We're talking about stockpiling. Do you, do you ever remember if you've grown up in church where the, the people would pull up into church or you'd see them out in the community and they'd just be a really beat up car and the bumper sticker on the back would say what? My treasure is in heaven, right? And, and some of you, some of us grew up in spaces where if you had next to nothing, that was a sign that you were more spiritual. Where you're like, we have nothing, that's good because all of my treasure is in heaven. Once again, that is a gross application and not what Jesus means when he's saying this. What he's saying is, what can you take with you? What can you take with you? Because we, we are, we have an eternal soul in us and we are eternal beings that will live forever in this place called forever in eternity. A destiny is forever. This body is temporary. So Jesus is saying while living in time and space, when it comes to money, think in terms of treasure, treasure and treasure is defined. The original definition of treasure is what can you take past the grave? What can you take with you past the grave? If you can't take it, he's saying, don't put your confidence in it, orient your life around it, and don't let that be your focus. That's what he's saying here, because it won't last. And ironically, let's look at 19 again. He talks about moth and rust, moth and rust. Do you, do you find that interesting? 
Because I read that and I'm like, moth and rust, what? The reason is because about 2000 years ago, when people were stockpiling their savings account like we have today, it consisted of two primary things, expensive cloths and precious metals. That, that's what it was. And I can't help but look back when I discovered this, I was like moth and rust and it's expensive cloth and precious metals that they're hoarding. But I can't, I can't help but look back on that time and say cloth and metal? Well, you were living for cloth and metal? That is so dumb. What, what, what is happening? But, but let's be honest. We can look back in ancient time and say, wait a minute, Jesus actually had to tell people quit collecting cloth and metal. He's saying, don't make your life about expensive material and precious metals. Let's think about this. Let's say the earth goes on another 2,000 years ago or 2,000 years from now. It goes on 2,000 years. Could it be that that people group 2,000 years from now will look back on today and say, wait, so people were really making their lives about flat screens and shoes and cars and like homes that were on the ground that didn't float up in the air, like, like literal, literal homes on the ground, Man, we would never. And it puts things in perspective. Looking back 2000 years ago, you wanna go, you wanna go back and say, hey guys, 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 precious metal and cloth, what a waste of time, don't do that. And then you translate it in today, and I wonder, have we fallen for the same trick? Are we living our life for stuff and things? Now, Jesus isn't against your stuff or your things. He's, he's not anti-flat screen, not anti-car, not anti your shoes, okay? Relax for a minute, but is that our focus? Is that where we put our confidence? He's saying only what is forever is true treasure. And we're, we're talking about Jesus here. So let's, let's define treasure. Here, here's the great thing about money. Money can actually be used for things that are forever. Forever. I'll tell you what you'll have forever. Memories. Generational memories. And I, you know what? I'm, I'm up here and I'll, I'll be honest with you. I believe in saving. I believe in a budget. We're open about all that. We'll, we'll show you whatever you want to know about this church. We are wide open and we'll sit down with you and guide you through our budget, whatever you want to do. But personally, you know, I want to be able to retire. I want to be able to do things with my wife, with my friends and family. I, d I don't want to, to save money and miss memories. I don't want to not do things and be like, just wait until later on. We got to hoard this money and miss memories. The goal of life, according to Jesus in Matthew 6, is not to just save a bunch of money and not use it for what is forever. What else is forever? Relationships. Friendships. Hold on a second. He may say, Matt, this is pretty obvious stuff. You know, if you have anything more profound today, I brought a friend. Hold, hold on a second. We, we ruin friendships based on money. We cut off friends for money. They, they say one of the quickest ways to ruin a relationship is what? Go in business together. There's so many Christians that I've spoke to and they're saying, they're saying one of the best advice I got was don't go into business with family. Don't go into business with friends. Why? Because evidently our nature is to sacrifice what is forever for what is finite right now, right at this moment. And I just want to say and be honest with you, I vacillate too. I do. I, I, I vacillate from money won't make us happy, Crystal, versus but, but could I try and see if it does? Like, like I, I, I love those who are, are I, I've friends or, or people that I've spoke to that are extremely wealthy and they're like, listen, it won't make you happy. And I'm like, yeah, but you got to try. Like, I want to try this. 
You have one day, it's like, I don't need money. I'm going to give it all away. I'm going to give it all away. I'm going to give it all away. What kind of car was that? God, I want, I, I want that. And I want, to, I want to be open with you about how much I vacillate. When I became a pastor, my wife and I had to make a decision. And I kept going back to that 29-year-old self because coming into ministry to be a pastor, it meant that we had to take an $80,000 a year pay cut to come into ministry full time. And I had to go back to that 29-year-old self and say, we are not doing this for money. We're not doing this for money. We're doing it to change eternity. We're here to expand eternity, to get people that we love to eternity. And we were moving here to this island and we're in our basement going through boxes that we've had. And I go and I find my old pay stubs and I'm like, oh man, do I miss that? Like, can we get back to, to that number somehow? So I, I want you to know that I vacillate too. Because money is, is an emotional thing, isn't it? It's amazing. Uh, us preachers can preach about giving money away and living for Jesus. And in the moment, we mean it. But like anyone else, money is on the mind a lot. And it's a gut check. It's a heart check. What am I doing this for? I don't, I don't want to live my life for cloth and metal. How funny does that sound? Where you say, hey, what, what, are, what are your big goals? Hey, Crystal Matt, what are your big goals for 2022? I, 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 we need more expensive cloth and metal. <laughs> that is so dumb. Hear me. It wasn't 2,000 years ago. It was so real. Jesus spoke right to it. This is how they determined if each person were successful or worth something. Does that translate at all? Jesus says, I want you to focus on what is forever. And then right here, verse 22, or one more. It says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is in you, Light in you is darkness. How great is the darkness? And, and I'm saying, are, are we still talking about money? Are we still talking about cloth, about, about metal? And suddenly we can look at how much money affects our life and body. It can actually affect you physically, church. It can affect you physically. Greed can hurt your body. Jesus is saying you get stingy. You get this evil eye of greed, this darkness of your, uh, over your life. Greed is this insidious desire for more. I need more. Greed has one sermon and, and it preaches all day long. Once you get that, you'll be happy. Only to get that and you'll be like, whoa, that, that, I, got a, I got a new phone like a year ago. And Apple keeps coming out with these new phones like every three and a half days. And I'm like, look, look at that one though. Like I thought I'd be happy with this, but greed, we keep listening to the same sermon. Greed only has one. You need that, you need that, you need that. Parents, have you ever had a conversation with your kids and they're like, mom, dad, I need that. And I've had the conversation with my daughter and said, you don't say I need that. You need air. You need water. You need Jesus. You don't need that hair straightener. <laughs> Crystal thinks she does. So. <laughs> but this, this, this sermon that greed preaches of you'll be happier when you get there. And I at church, to be honest, I have podcasted that sermon so many times. I bought in. I did it. I got it. And then I was like, wait, what? And greed, it, greed's like, wait, what, what, what's wrong? And you're like, I'm not feeling good. I'm not happy. I got that. I'm not happy. And greed said, well, that's because you also need this. And you need that. And all of a sudden, Jesus said, there will be a darkness in your soul. Like this cloud coverage where, where things just seem cloudy, just hazy in your life. And you can't figure out what to do. Be careful. He's saying money can do that. But then we go to verse 24. No one can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters. 
So in a, 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 a different translation, it says no one can serve two gods. And I am thinking, did you say gods? Okay, Jesus, are you trying to tell us that money is either a master or a servant and there's no in between? Yes. Money is only one of two things. It's either a master in your life or a servant in your life. There is no in between. There is no neutrality. We play pretend that there's neutrality with money. There is not. And you have to make a decision. Is money going to serve me or am I going to serve money? Because there's a term in scripture called mammon. And mammon, when it comes to money, is this godlike concept because money wants to master you. It wants to direct you. It wants to lead you. He wants to guide your decisions. And, and Jesus is warning us against this. He's warning us that, that if money is the source of your confidence, your focus, your money starts to direct your emotional disposition, you are going to develop a, cont a contempt for the one true God. And here's what happens. Christians, followers of Jesus, those who are in love with Jesus, God does not deliver on their expectations financially. And they literally start getting mad at God. There's a contempt with God. And that's a scary place to be. You may say, Matt, how do you know this? Because I've been there. I've been there. And we allow money to move in and to tell us our priorities. But can I, can I give you a rule of thumb? It rarely, if ever, works out in your favor when you make a decision only based on money. Only based on money. I think you should make a decision based on God and what he values. But I want to have a little PS, a little pastor moment for you right here. If you currently, right now, are facing a, a significant decision in your life and money is involved, can I urge you to ask yourselves the hard questions? To ask other people's, people in your group these hard questions because I'm telling you it rarely if ever ends in your favor when you make a significant decision just on, based on money. How do I know it? Because I've done it. And if you haven't, your mother Teresa, and we're so glad that you're here, fill out a connection card before you leave. But for the rest of us, we get, the, no, I'm not gonna do that. And then compensation comes out and you're like, wait, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I said I wasn't gonna do that, but what, what, what did you say? Yeah, we, we thought we'd just up the compensation a little bit. Well, well, I just felt that God just changed his mind and I want to be a part of what you're doing. And I just wish we could be more honest and say, sometimes I do things for money. And money can quickly become a master instead of a servant. And you may say, maybe then Matt, this is not one of the most encouraging messages, but... I want to go back to one of the pithiest statements Jesus has ever been quoted as saying. And that's in verse 21. Verse 21 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I'm going to sit on this for a moment. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And as, as I close... And when I say I close, I'll say like eight times that I'll close. It'll be like in an hour or so. But uh, I'd like to share with you about my life. Now, since I was that 29-year-old kid in California looking at that $500 check, a lot has happened in my life. And I'm not necessarily proud of these moments, but there have been some seasons, some moments in my life where it's gone from something like this. How did I get here? How did I get here? That, that 29 year old kid in California eating sushi with his hero was far from perfect. And I had some wide eyed wonder. I, I just thought Jesus was everything. I loved my pastor, wanted to be like him. And I thought the coolest thing in the world was to tell people about Jesus. I really did, I really did. Since then, I've honestly been living a dream. I married the only woman that I said I love you to outside of my family. I married the most beautiful woman in the world. We have an incredible daughter. I get to pastor, honestly, the greatest church in the world. You're amazing. All of you are amazing. But since I was 29, I probably had a handful of moments where I asked myself, 
How did I get here? Meaning, it, am I living for cloth and metal? Did I trade the savior of the universe and the lover of my soul for a cloth and, and metal? Have I got caught up? What am I doing? And then it gets worse. This has happened a few times in the 12 years of my ministry where the rabbit hole gets deeper and I start to, to think, am I a fake? Has this whole thing just been a facade? Has, has this whole thing been for just a lot of economical reasons? Is this just the career that I chose? And boy, you have, you have those dark nights of the soul and I just wish more preachers would talk about it. Because that 29 year old didn't know that there would be a board of a church where, hey, we have to make sure the lights stay on, the salaries are paid, the missions we're, we're given here, um, the, make sure the finances are okay. And then on the other hand, I have a family and a child and all of a sudden I'm like, wait, what, what is all this? But we, we do our best as preachers to say, it's not about money, it's not about economics, yet it's a big part of the world. So I have these moments talking to myself saying, am I a fake? Can, can I be honest with you? I've, I've seen people I've seen boards, I've seen churches, I've seen pastors do not so great things in church with money. And there's some people here who have been hurt and pushed and have money thrown at them, tithing thrown at them. I've heard, heard stories about it. And you start to wonder, would I still do this if there wasn't any compensation? And maybe you're saying, Matt, Matt, you, I'm not a preacher, you kind of lost me, but have you ever felt like a fake? Where you say, did I start following Jesus for what was in it for me? Did I decide Jesus was the right way because it was, it was the best way to have perceived success? Is that why I'm doing this? Because it sells. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. But this stuff sells. People willingly trust, hey man, I'm a Christian. Oh, okay, oh yeah, yeah, let's go into business together. I, I rear-ended at somebody while I was high on pain pills. And he gets out of the car and he looks and he says, I see you have a, a, a Jesus fish on the back of your bumper. We're good, man, don't even worry about it. And people willingly trust. And all of a sudden, if we aren't going to be honest, let's just wrap up and go get something to eat, right? Let's be honest here. But, but I have felt like a fake. And that leads us to this concluding story of Peter. He's one of the 12. He's considered the oldest. The, the, the only one probably over 21. He denies Jesus three times in about 60 minutes, about an hour. He denies Jesus three times. He, and he denies his best friend while he's in the most agonizing moment of his life where Jesus is being led away to be murdered and they're like hey don't you know no 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 that's not me hey I, I saw you with it no no that is not me three times say no 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 that's not me he abandons the one he swore he would always obey and the story goes on and Jesus hangs there for six hours suffocating in his own blood gruesome death dies on the cross, buried in a rich man's tomb. Meanwhile, back in Peter's life, he concludes, I'm a fake. I'm a fake. He goes back to his old job, which was fishing. He said, I'm, I'm a fake. I'm going back. I'm going fishing. And the story goes in John's gospel. Jesus shows up and is supernatural, but Jesus starts fixing breakfast. He already has breakfast cooking on a charcoal fire. The charcoal is to remind Peter of the charcoal that he smelled when he denied Jesus. But he did that charcoal fire, and that's a whole different sermon, did that charcoal fire to remind him, next time you smell a charcoal fire, you're not going to be reminded about the time you denied me. You're going to be reminded about the time I cooked you breakfast. So he's cooking him breakfast. And they come to shore. And he sits by Peter, fixing him breakfast, and he, he feeds him. 
And this very wonky conversation unfolds. It's hard to understand. But Jesus said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And suddenly you can conclude Jesus is now questioning whether or not Peter is the real deal. And I remember thinking this in regards to economics because money church is a revealer. And when you question, am I doing this for money? It's one of those telltale signs. Hey, Matt, you're a fraud. You're a fake. You're only doing this because it benefits you financially. You say it's for love. You say it's for mission. You say it's for forgiveness. You say it's for Jesus. But look, and it's revealed to you. And the pressure makes you question. And Peter, the pressure, Peter starts to question. Maybe Peter didn't love Jesus. Maybe it was all talk. And I think Peter concluded, I'm a fake. And Jesus asked, do you love me? And, and Peter must have been, he has to be in such emotional agony. Of the one that he just denied three times is sitting there feeding him breakfast. And he asked him, do you love me? And he's like, I do. It was more like, I, I think I do. Do you think I love you, Jesus? Jesus asked again. Jesus doesn't ask questions again on accident or because he's unsure or unclear. Jesus asks again to make a statement. He said, do you love me? Exasperated, the Bible said, he says, I love you. You know I love you. And he says, tend my sheep. Jesus asks the third time. And he says, Lord, you know, you know. In other words, I don't know if I know. You know I love you. Church, this encounter is not Jesus figuring out whether or not Peter is fake. This is Jesus allowing Peter to figure out whether or not he's a fake. And what is it saying? He's saying, Peter, I came to your old job to find you, to make you breakfast, to let you know that you aren't a fake. You screwed up. It was selfish. You abandoned me. It hurt. But I know you love me. And church, I've been to this passage more than once because this passage has spoken to me so many times. Here's my conclusion. The, the next one. When it comes to money, I'm going to need Jesus to fix me breakfast more than once. I'm going to need him to find me in those moments where I start to wonder, is this all ego? And economics? Am I the thing I despised growing up? I, am I a part of the problem, no longer a part of the solution? Is this why we're here? Is this why we're doing this? And maybe you can relate. Maybe you fell in love with Jesus and you're like, this is amazing, I'm on, on fire. And before long, you fe now feel like a church consumer, a church critic, a professional Christian trying to build brands and visions and ideas so you can make resource of money. And you say, wait a minute, has mission turned into just profit? I'm a fake. And you may say, pastor, how will I figure this out? You won't unless Jesus meets you. You won't. And that same Jesus that met a broken, hurting man named Peter is the same Jesus that will meet you. Why? Because he has met me. And he comes not to condemn. He comes not to critique. He knows you're human. He knows you're dust. But he comes to remind you that you are not a fake and you do love Jesus. But when it comes to money, we vacillate. And what we need time and time again is the point of it all is to encounter Jesus once again. To take me back to that 29 year old in California and say, that's still in you, Pastor. That moment is still in you. You know how much you love talking about me? That's still in you. And do you know why God loves you? Go, why God knows you love him? Because he put the love in my heart to love him with. And he's done the same with you. This, I'm just going to take a risk today, okay? I'm going to be bold. But I don't believe you're a fake. Someone needs to hear that. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I don't believe you're a fake. I don't believe this is about just economics or economics at all. I don't believe that's why you're here. I think we have these moments, that it's seasons, it's challenging, but I think like Peter, we've beat, beaten ourselves up and we've concluded, that's not who I am. And Jesus wants to remind us today who we are. 
That's why Jesus is here today. I think about money a lot. But Jesus is helping me think about him even more. And Jesus says to Peter, you love me so much, you're going to die for me, Peter. And we look at that as a negative. And he's like, that's the ultimate honor. In that moment, Jesus is saying, you're going to give everything to me. And you know what must have filled Peter's heart right at that moment? I'm not a fake. I'm not a fake. Jesus has shown me. I do love you. You know what's amazing? I don't know if Peter lives the life he does without that true moment. Because he'll always be able to look at that breakfast with Jesus and say, he told me who I was. Let's pray. Father, we know subjects like this are tough. Just to be real and honest, I pray that this church, these people continue just to be real, open and honest. Look at the life of you, Lord, and not try to add or take away anything from it. Lord, to do what you have asked us to do, to look at money the way that you have asked us to do, Lord. And Lord, I pray that money never becomes a master in one, one two church. Lord, that we will use money to serve people, to serve others, to serve you. Lord, let us always keep that mindset. Always remember or remind us to go back to when we first encountered you and that fire that you lit within us, that is still there. That we are not fakes, we are not frauds, that, that we are just broken people following a perfect savior. With every eye closed, if today you wanna to say yes to Jesus and you've never said yes to Jesus before, but you're like, pastor, something is moving inside of me. The Bible says you believe in your heart and speak with your lips that he is God. That it's as easy as saying yes to him and you can spend eternity with him. That he has given everything for us. And all we have to do is say yes. If that's you today, would you raise your hand with no one watching? Would anyone like that? Yes, I see that hand. Would anyone else like that? Father, you are so, so good. Thank you, Lord, for these moments we can be real and vulnerable. And talk about the things that you talked about. And thank you, Lord, for not being ashamed or afraid to talk about the hard stuff. In your name we pray. Amen. This is a special moment. Um, there's going to be no words on the screen. Because I want you to be able to just listen to the words that are saying. But uh, I love this man so much. It hasn't been long since I've known him, but I, I love the heart of this man. And I am so blessed that he's going to be able to share his talent with us. He wrote this song a while back, and this is exactly what One Two Church is about. Please welcome Mark Allen Atwood. Love you, brother. This isn't a Mark Allen Atwood show, it's church. So you don't need to hear a bunch of words from me. I just want to say that I didn't know what to expect when I came here. I've been coming here for almost a couple of months now. Everybody's been so nice and so welcoming. I thank you. Speaking your mind these days Brings you closer to folks who think like you. Hating your fellow man, being different than you are, is the number one cause of tearing this world in two. I'm a peace loving redneck, and I'm a hippie in a hat, still dumb enough to 
think that love thy neighbor is where it's at. And if there's a man upstairs, he's looking down from above. I'd bet my life he'd like to see less strife and a little more love. are closing up their ranks. We'll keep ours with us and keep yours away and anything else, no thanks. Further and further and further we get from each other every day. I'm not sure what the point is. So we're all dying the same away. I'm a peace-loving redneck and I'm a hippie in a hat. Still dumb enough to think that love thy neighbor is where it's at. And if there's a man upstairs, he's looking down from above. I'd bet my life he'd like to see less drive. No, it ain't a Hallmark card. It's not decorations once a year you stick in your front yard. No, it's reaching out in your own town to a scared or hungry kid. It's not a bracelet asking what would he do. It's exactly what he did. I'm a peace-loving redneck. I'm a hippie. Frank, for the use of this building. Why don't you give Frank a hand? This is this has been fantastic. I know uh, today's sermon was kind of different, uh, but I want you to know my heart before we move into the the tougher topic of, of tithing and offering and what Jesus says about that. Because my job, my job is to be able to teach you the things that Jesus has asked me to teach you guys. And no matter how no matter how much trouble it'll get me in with other people or uh, how tough it is for me to share or the attacks that may come I want you to know that when, when we stand before our maker it's only us and him and I want him to be able to say, I gave you the message and you delivered it. So thank you for walking through these tough subjects with me. And uh, just be praying for next week and the weeks to come because it's not going to be easy. But with all of you guys here, it's going to be worth it. Love you. God bless you. We'll see you this week.